Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Yes, hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Tyler Alderson and I'm here to talk about a whole range of topics with someone who has answered a lot of questions over the years, I believe eight years. Uh, Stuart Ellis Gorman, known as Valkyne on Ask Historians and uh, the author of The Medieval Crossbow, uh, which is uh, coming out on May 30th of 2022. And uh, thank you so much, Stuart, for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It is. It's great to have you. And it's, it has been eight years, you said. Yeah. So I, I was actually, I was doing one of these, like, uh, F- Flare user surveys. was kind of like, you know, how do you answer the questions and what could make the experience better? And I had a question, like, how long have you been on it? And I was like, there's a three to five years button. And I was like, yeah, three to five years. That sounds right. That sounds right. I should check, though. I should I should double check. And I have a Flare user profile. And in it, I keep my first answer kind of buried in the middle, uh, which was also, I think, my most popular answer, which is a little tragic for me. But so I clicked onto that one. And it was like, this was eight years ago. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, five plus years. Then I'll click the five plus box. <laughs> That's uh, it's funny how things can kind of sneak up, especially uh, during the pandemic. It feels like everything time has just gone completely sideways. Uh, so this this book that you have coming out, the medieval crossbow, um, I think a lot of people are probably very familiar, at least with the uh, look of the crossbow from fantasy from movies and and what have you. Um, but I guess for anyone who is not fully, you know, doesn't fully uh, understand the, the the concept of it. Can you just describe what it is we're talking about and how it, uh, you know, it's, it's early development, how it came to be? Yeah. So in all things history, this is extremely contentious. So you can get <laughs> off, you can get off on a good foot there. Uh, there's sort of two schools of debate when it comes to defining a crossbow. So your, your basic con- core piece is that a crossbow has a bow, uh, which I'm hoping we're all familiar with. And then it's mounted on some kind of stock or tiller. Uh, those are the two terms used interchangeably. I think I used tiller in my PhD and then stock in my book just to be inconsistent. And then the kind of key contention is, does a crossbow have to have a trigger to be a crossbow? So there's one school that defines if you just mount a bow onto like another piece of wood in the shape approximately of a cross, what you have made is a, an arrow guide. So it's something that you pull back and you release and you rest the arrow on it and that a crossbow must have a trigger. Uh, so a mechanism to hold the string in place, you then place the bolt, and then you pull the trigger to shoot it. Uh, I'm a little agnostic on that and didn't didn't super get into it. I kind of see the benefits of the distinction, but I'm not sure it's very useful. Certainly in a medieval European military context, you don't get a lot of arrow guides. So you're mostly just talking about crossbows and bows. The origins are also, well, the early origins are not contested at all. The crossbow is from ancient China. Uh, it's its earliest evidence. I mean, there are crossbowmen in the terracotta army. Uh, and there's been some excavations, I think, of er, slightly earlier crossbows as well. So we're certainly looking at kind of very early imperial China. And uh, the earliest textual reference, I think, is in Sun Tzu's The Art of War. He, make, he makes a metaphor comparing like a well-posed army to a crossbow ready to fire. Kind of, I mean, your translation can differ, but it's approximately that. So it kind of even implies that by Sun Tzu's time, a crossbow is a fairly established and well-known weapon, so it's not even new. We don't really have much before that, but yeah, so it's it's common in ancient China. It's very widely used. Um, I have to admit, I don't read Chinese, so my my I'm reliant on work by Joseph Needham and other scholars on the kind of early Chinese origins of the weapon. The contentious bit is when it shows up in Europe. So it's around. We it's generally thought to be around in ancient Rome, but it's debated. So we have reference. We don't have any surviving crossbows from ancient Rome. So in ancient China, we have a few kind of archaeological digs that have turned up mostly complete crossbows and just mountains of triggers. There's this um, mostly associated with the Han Dynasty, but used in several other dynasties. They have this very distinctive bronze trigger mechanism. And there's just like hundreds of these. Like they're everywhere. They were clearly mass produced. So there's just heaps of evidence in China. In ancient Rome. You don't have any of that archaeology, and instead you're reliant on references in Vegetius and a few other authors that references to things like Archibalista and Manubalista, uh, 
uh, as a subset of ballista, which then has inspired this debate that ballista is a large sea torsion powered weapon that looks like a crossbow, but functions very differently because instead a crossbow is effectively a spring and uses a kind of a spring based power because it's like a bow uh, versus a torsion weapon functions slightly differently. So ballista has two independent arms that are both torsion powered. Mm. Uh, this is completely leaving aside the debate about whether or not we should call catapults ballistas, which is a separate classics warfare <laughs> argument where a, ballista, where a catapult is a one-armed ballista, which is just, I don't even want to get into that, but there's this huge terminology problem um, that basically you have this ancient weapon called a ballista that looks kind of like a crossbow and everyone knew it looked kind of like a crossbow. So in the middle ages, they just call crossbows ballistas. And so then you have Vegetius referring to like bow crossbows and smaller cross or smaller ballistas and bow ballistas and things. And you're like, are these crossbows? I mean, they could be, but also it's a little esoteric. And it's not like he spends a lot of time talking about them. And there's a few other authors who kind of mentioned use similar terms. Um, and that that's kind of generally led to the belief that there probably were crossbows in ancient Rome, but they weren't very popular. They weren't very widely used. I mean, the ancient Roman military isn't very famous for its missile weapon or portable missile weaponry. Um, so there's that kind of debated origin. And then there's a few artistic images of what look like crossbows. And this is where we get into our crossbow bow guide issue is that we have some, uh, Roman Gallic kind of fifth through seventh century. One of them was found in situ and is approximately fourth, fifth century. And there was another one that turned up in a cellar in like the 18th century, I think late 18th, summer of the 18th century. So we have like the dating is artistically it's somewhere Romano-Gallic, but we just found it down here somewhere. So we don't really know where it came from, uh, but they're very, they look very similar. So they probably are from similar time periods. Uh, and they're, one of them is a scene of people going out to hunt. And one of the individuals is carrying a crossbow tucked or a bow guy tucked under his arm because it's a bit abstracted. So there's a debate like, is there a trigger? Is there not a trigger? Uh, and then there's another one that's a, a kind of an image of a hunter's equipment. And it's got like a quiver, his dog, a knife, and what looks a lot like a crossbow. So for my money, probably crossbows in ancient Rome. There's also a side thing where we get into the ancient Greeks who have this weapon called the gastrophates, uh, which is a weapon that was spanned using the archer's stomach. It's, it's very hard to explain without a picture, but basically it was like a, a really big crossbow, we think. Now we'll get into like what we actually know about it later, but it had this kind of bit of the stock that would stick further out. And the way you spanned it was instead of, Normally, a crossbow, you'd pull the string back with your hands, usually resting the bow on the ground um, at its most basic before we get into the fancy devices. This one, you put this kind of extended bit of the stock against the ground, and then you put your stomach against the other end of the stock, and you just pushed down on it, and it would push the string back until it got caught in this kind of latch trigger. And this, like, it's described in Heron of Alexander, who's writing kind of around the first century, the first image we have of a diagram is from the Middle Ages. It's not very common. And Heron is describing it as something that's like pretty old by the time he's writing. Uh, so it's kind of like probably if you, I think some people think it might have been fourth, fifth century, but it's, it's very hazy, like the kind of stuff we know about it. So there's this one school that says, well, the crossbow is clearly in China. Like we know it's in China. And Joseph Needham would point out that it appears in Roman sources around a time we know that Rome and China had some contact. So it makes the most sense that it comes over from there. But then we have this gastrophedia. So maybe there's this independent invention where it's derived from this very obscure Greek weapon. Uh, and then we have this obscure Roman weapon. And the thing that really confuses it all then is that we don't get like any text references really in the early middle ages to crossbows. They pop up again in sources in kind of the eighth, ninth century uh, the siege account, an account, very obscure account. Well, the account is very famous, but the it's this poetic account of the siege of Paris that's very obscure to read. And so you kind of have to, again, deal with this classical illusions issue, like does ballista mean crossbow or does ballista mean uh, large siege weapon? And often you're kind of stuck with like, okay, well, if it's got a, like four people with it, it's probably a siege weapon. But if this guy's carrying it around on his own, it's probably a crossbow. Um, but we kind of, we clearly ninth century, we're getting some some evidence of crossbows which spawns an entire debate of does it disappear or is it just not in the sources? There are fewer sources in the early Middle Ages, so it could just be lack of survival. References to in texts in medieval Europe become fairly common from the 11th century. Um, and so we know lots, lots of crossbows are being used, but archaeological evidence for European crossbows, well, whole crossbows are 14th century and later. So very tail end of the Middle Ages. 
which mm. also makes it very difficult to establish what they looked like earlier. Uh, we have artistic evidence, which is always exciting to work with in any period, and particularly in the Middle Ages, where they loved weird abstract art, uh, which I think is great, but it, it's difficult to interpret. Uh, we do have some archaeological evidence, like things like the the cross bits of crossbow survive, particularly crossbow nuts, which are the uh, bit usually made of horn that the string is, I hold on to the string. So it's usually mostly a cylinder with a one or two fingers that stick out, and that's what the string attaches to. And they're very durable. So you dig them up. We have them for many centuries. The thing is, they tell you basically nothing about what the crossbow looks like, except that it had this very distinctive crossbow trigger that's very different from the Chinese one. Mm. Uh, and they can tell you useful things about where crossbows were used. So like, if you dig them up in a castle dating to around the time of major siege, you can identify that there are there are probably crossbows there. There's an interesting study about a siege in Vilnius between the Teutonic Knights and the native people there that suggests that there were crossbows on both sides. Uh, usually Teutonic Knights are associated with crossbows and then the Eastern Slavic peoples they were invading are less associated with them. And then similarly, you can identify places where crossbows probably made that way. There's been interesting studies around, you know, plotting out where crossbows were, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about what types of crossbows there were, what they looked like, except for this specific trigger feature. So I, I, I have to admit that I, this is very, very far from, uh, my realm of uh, knowledge. But one of the questions that I've always had, and I'm so glad to have you on, um, bow and arrow, I've used a bow and arrow. Um, it's, it's. I was just going to say it has some drawbacks, no pun intended. Um, but um, what what does the crossbow do for you? What's your, what, what does, uh, what are the advantages or why would one use a crossbow um, to propel an arrow as opposed to, um, a a bow and arrow, or or, or are they actually actually not that similar? So, like the big the big difference for a crossbow, I would say, is that a crossbow stays loaded. So you can you can prep it and then you can keep it loaded, and this allows all sorts of options where like you can crouch behind. If you're in a siege, you can crouch behind the wall to load your weapon and then pop out and shoot. Uh, in hunting, it's very different because it means you can stalk more easily with your uh, arrow ready or your bolt ready to shoot. And also, it is slightly more compact, which makes a big difference in some of those environments. Uh, the other big difference is that they can be made to be significantly more powerful. So your average, like when you get to, there's a lot of, okay, there's a lot of debate to be had here about how powerful crossbows were. Uh, part of it is that the archaeological evidence is quite thin. You can't really get it from text evidence. So you really want archaeological evidence. And it's much it's most of the ones that do survive are not in shape to be drawn again. Now, you, if you read some exciting older historians uh, like Sir Ralph Payne Galway, who's kind of currently the most available work on the crossbow, which is published in 1903, he owned a bunch of like 16th century steel crossbows and he just went out shooting with them. I'll tell you about what it was like, you know, like I'm just going to go out and take a few shots and it's great fun. And you're like, Jesus, these are artifacts. What are you doing, man? Uh, but, <laughs> but generally, particularly if you're looking at steel and composite crossbows, I mean, you're talking draw weights that are, maybe up to order a magnitude higher than a, a longbow. Now you have to mitigate that some crossbows are also significantly less efficient weapons than longbows, particularly steel crossbows, because the bow is much, much heavier and you lose a lot of force when you have to return the arms to the original resting place. So whereas a bow, be, it can be quite highly efficient if it's well-made, a crossbow is going to be much lower. So while you might be seeing a crossbow that's, you know, 10 times the draw weight, when you account for the efficiency, it might, it's not going to be 10 times more powerful than a longbow. Mm. But generally... They're, they are capable of being much more powerful weapons. This then reaches the caveat, though, that to get those powers, you need to start using very sophisticated drawing mechanisms. So get these machines like windlasses and cranikins, which are two different cranking systems for drawing back a crossbow string and are uh, quite slow. I mean, generally, we estimate if you're really trained with them and you know what you're doing, you get maybe two shots a minute with those. So you're much lower rate of fire, which then opens debate like, to how widely were those actually used in warfare? Because there are lots of faster ways to draw crossbows. The simplest is a thing called a belt hook, which is a hook on your belt. And then you have a stirrup on the bottom of your crossbow. And what you do, there's some debate, I think both forms were used. There's one where you crouch down, you put your foot in the stirrup, you crouch down, you put the hook on the string and you stand up. The other one is that you balance on one foot, you put your foot in the stirrup, you put the hook on the string, and then you push down with your leg. And then you draw it that way. So that way you lose your leg muscles instead of your arm muscles to draw mm. the weapon. So that's much more efficient. 
Uh, and these were probably like the old school of crossbow history was that bigger was better. So when you got heavier weapons, you used heavier weapons and you used windlasses and chronicans when they were invented and you like composite replaced wood, which replaced, which was then replaced by steel. What we know from the historical record is this isn't true. I mean, belt hooks are used throughout the entire middle ages. Wooden crossbows remained very popular in the 15th century, at least. Um, 16th century is kind of when you begin to see, uh, steel crossbows become the dominant form, but that's also when crossbows stop being used in warfare and are primarily a sporting weapon. So you see a real transition in technology then. So then it kind of gets into this, well, okay, if we're using the lighter drawing techniques, then the power gap between a bow and a crossbow is is less significant. So I would say generally crossbows have the advantage of they are slightly easier to shoot because you can load your weapon, you can take aim, and you can shoot much more patiently. You know, you don't have to do that thing where when you draw a bow, it's there straining against your arm the entire time you're trying to take a shot. It's also going to be less exhausting, particularly if you're using your leg muscles versus trying to pull the arm back every time. But often I'd say they're actually more comparable than a lot of historians have led to think bows and crossbows. So it's there's a amount of personal preference. And in the Middle Ages, you also see there's a tendency that crossbowmen are better paid and better equipped and represent a slightly more higher rank in society. That's not, I mean, they're not like the elite of the nobility, but they're often rich urban burghers and, and townspeople and guild members and things. So you do kind of see them them being classified as a slightly more elite troop, which then in turn means they get paid more and they have to bring better equipment. So it's not just that they're bringing a crossbow, which is slightly, which is more expensive than a bow generally, but also they're going to be wearing better armor and they're going to be bringing, you know, better equipment overall. And they might be bringing a page or this. So you kind of have that in the stratified society, maybe your crossbow are classified slightly higher. And some of that might be due to the weapon. And some of that's just because they were the richer ones. So there's a lot of kind of weird effects going on there and in, in what, why you pick a crossbow or a bow. And the, uh, the, the subtitle of your book, a, uh, uh, a weapon fit to kill a king, uh, where, does, where does that come into play? So that came out of the Richard I originally. So mm-hmm. Richard I, uh, somewhat famously, is killed by a crossbow. So he's besieging this tiny castle in France, uh, the story around it is wild. I mean, there's there's several versions of it, and one of them is this: the the, uh, the person in the castle found a lost treasure, and Richard demanded it, and he's punished by God. And there's all this kind of moralizing, particularly because a lot of it's written by French writers, and this is at a time where Richard's at war with Philip II, and a lot of it is even written after Philip II drives King John out of France. So, but there's this great there, the thing that kind of really triggered it for me is there's this great bit written by um, I can't remember his name now but this biographer of Philip II. And he basically, in his second book about Philip II, he writes, he writes an earlier one and then a later one. He says that it's absolutely, it's like poetic justice that Richard I is killed by a crossbow because he introduced the crossbow to France. And that's a sinful weapon. And I loved it because it's insane. Like the crossbow had been <laughs> to France for, for ages. Like we're even like 50 years after the Second Lateran Council supposedly bans the crossbow. Uh, in Christian warfare. So like, it's just this really wild line. So I really like to dig into that. But then also you have this interesting story of this king who he's patrolling the walls of the castle he's going to investigate. And some guy just basically pops over the wall and shoots him in the side. And the the story is that he's not wearing his armor because he doesn't think he's, he's not actually going to attack it. He's preparing to assault it. And he's got a shield bearer. So he's got this guy who carries this big shield around. It's supposed to be in between him and people who are trying to take shots at him. And that guy basically... Some accounts differ who's who's at blame. Is Richard does Richard step away from the shield? Does the shield bearer mess up? But Richard gets shot in the side. Uh, he doesn't actually die instantly. Uh, instead, he gets gangrene, and there's some pretty horrific descriptions of like the surgeries that are done to him to try. They fail to remove the arrowhead, and he gets gangrene. He dies like two weeks later. And there's another story that comes out. I think it's Roger of Howden who writes that he summons because he st- his army storms the castle while he's dying and captures the garrison. And there's a story where he has the man who shot him brought before him and he pardons him and then he dies. And then the other guys flay the man alive uh, instead of pardoning him, uh, which is almost certainly made up. Like there's two different versions of who actually shot him. And there's all this kind of, there's one account that says the guy didn't even know it was King Richard. He just like shot some stupid looking French king. Cause of course Richard the first spent most of his time in France. Uh, and, uh, and then was like, Oh, that was the king. Whoops. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting story and I, I knew I kind of wanted to open on that because I think it's an interesting count. He's the most famous person to be killed by a crossbow. 
But then I kind of found all these really weird stories about, about people being shot by crossbows. And I decided I kind of wanted to dig into it. So I, each kind of section of the book starts with a little bit about the crossbow. And in many cases, I tried to find kings who there's a story of them being shot at, by crossbows. So there's you kind of go from the, the definite, King Richard I, definitely shot by a crossbow, dies of gangrene. Uh, and then I also have uh, King Valdemar III of Denmark, who was the first of two King Valdemar III's. Because uh, he was a co-king with his father, Valdemar II, and was called Valdemar III in his lifetime, and his gravestone says Valdemar III, but he predeceases his father. So a later King Valdemar took the number. Regnal numbering is wild when you actually get into it. <laughs> uh, I think it's fascinating. But anyway, he's he's accidentally killed on a hunt, in a hunting accident in the 13th century uh, by a crossbow. So we have kind of two definites. Then we have some slightly more, like, disputable ones that are that are... So one of them I use is uh, Harold Godwinson of the Battle of Hastings, who, of course, is famously shot in the eye. And one of the things you know from William Foytier writing about the battle is that the Norman army was preceded by crossbowmen. It wasn't preceded by archers. So the Bayou Tapestry has them using archers, but the written accounts, early written accounts, they're using crossbowmen. So it's like, well, if he's shot by an arrow, maybe he's shot by a crossbow. But then I also really get into the fact that the shot by an arrow thing is actually quite contentious. And there's a lot of debate among historians if he was actually killed by an arrow in the eye or if that's a, a story from a century later. So there's kind of an interesting debate about, well, was he shot in the eye or not to begin with? And if he was, was it narrow or was it a crossbow bolt? And then there's like the truly buck wild, which includes my favorite is Edmund II, Ironsides, uh, King of England, who is, according to the Geoffrey Geimer, this uh, French historian, medieval French historian who wrote his entire thing in poetry. Um, he writes that Edmund II was shot in the groin by a trap crossbow while using the toilet in the middle of the night. Which is amazing. I mean, it's that's, absolutely that's, not true. It's completely fantastic. wrong. But it's the greatest story. So somehow, I have like... Yeah. I was just going to say, somehow I knew that someone was going to get shot in the balls at some point. Yeah. Oh, it's great. He gets shot right in his fundament, as the 19th century person <laughs> translates it. I was like, I'm leaving that in. Yeah, shot in his <laughs> fundament. That's going to be good. That's going in the book. That And, and that... I. I, I, I'm sure people have said this to you before, but my, my immediate thought is to the Game of Thrones uh, scene. I don't know whether spoilers are, are really a thing anymore. If you haven't watched Game of Thrones at this point, I, I, don't, I, don't, know, uh, what, uh, I don't know if I'm spoiling, but the very big scene where a character gets shot by a crossbow while sitting on the toilet, I, I'd have to imagine there was some Yeah, it has to be a reference to that, because that, that is a very popular story, and it, it gets shared around in history, this idea that he was... Now, I mean, Kmart's writing like over a century later, I think maybe two centuries later, and there's a similar story by Henry of Huntington where he stabbed to death on the toilet from the same era, but the actual like stuff we have from around his time is that he just dies. He, he rules for less than a year. He's fighting against the invader, Knut, and he fights something like five battles in a year and then just dies. And like, yeah, he probably just got wounded and died. Right. <laughs> or just died because it's the Middle Ages. Like, you know, he's in the 11th century. This stuff just happens. And the, the, the getting shot in the toilet also seems, I mean, I, I can't imagine it's a particularly um, sympathetic uh, writing about him. It seems kind of, no. uh, would, would that be a, a way to humiliate him? In, in, in Yeah, it, it is kind of hilarious. Well, there's also this side thing where the guy who arranges his assassination, and this is in both uh, Guy and Huntington, goes to Canute to be like, look what I did. I helped you kill the king. And then Canute has him killed because he's like, you're not supposed to kill your king. Uh, so you've got that kind of nice little bit as well where like the just punishment of the traitor because even if this king was a bit shite, he's he's still the king. You have to respect him. <laughs> That's It's it's crazy to think that, um, uh, first of all, that someone would write an entire history uh, in poetry. Um, I, have you ever have you ever thought of doing that yourself? Or <laughs> absolutely not. No, it's wild when you read these histories that they've done all in verse. It's like, and and Gamer's thing, it's in it's in French verse. It's one of the earliest long form pieces of of medieval French. Um, so from a linguistic perspective, apparently, it's fascinating. I don't read medieval French, so I was just here <laughs> for the the shot and the fundament bit, but. <laughs> Um, when when you're this is something that I always I find interesting when you're reading these texts how is it that you you know that you go through and start picking apart what is what you can and can't um uh trust because and and it seems like every I mean this is something that every historian has to go through and every you know um uh every person has to kind of 
you know piece together but for you know for this era and for these texts what are the what are the things that you have to watch out for so one of the things that i i'm a big fan of is don't reinvent the wheel you know like particularly for a lot of these big medieval texts people have been working on them for their entire careers and i'm never going to exceed what they've done in in their lifetime on the grand scheme of things so i try to really specialize so particularly like a point key for me is crossbow terminology. So you're going to find a lot of weird terms for crossbows and a lot of people are going to struggle to interpret them. So you have to kind of dig in. There's a few articles that do it and just like start learning crossbow terms, and trying to learn to pick out what's interesting. So, you know, particularly with terms around when is it a crossbow, when is it not? And what technology is used with it. So you get this whole, there's this whole weird debate about this thing called a one foot crossbow or a two foot crossbow, which for about a century, maybe a little over a century there, it shows up in lots of records, particularly in England and France. There are one-foot crossbows and there are two-foot crossbows and there are crossbows ad turnum, or de torno, or, you know, something turn. And the last one we've all pretty much agreed is a crossbow span with a windlass, which is a form of crank, because that kind of makes the most sense. But like, what's a one-foot crossbow? We don't really know is the answer, but there's been a lot of debate about it, you know, where the thing that really messed it up. So there was an opinion for a long time that like, okay, a one foot crossbow is a crossbow you span using one foot. A two foot is when you span using two foot, which kind of makes sense until you're trying to think about how that works physically. But there's also a, like two references to a three foot crossbow, which just ruin everything. <laughs> so there's a lot of issue there. I mean, you have the kind of classic, how close to the, to the actual time is the person writing and how geographically close is really useful and how much access would they have had to primary sources which can lead to like interesting issues. So around the battle, I don't want to get too deep in the Battle of Crecy because people have written many books about this, but the Battle of Crecy is a really interesting event where we have tons of evidence. It's a really famous battle. Loads of people write about it and they almost all tell completely different accounts of what happened, including like what the army, how the armies were laid out and how things are going. And there's this, this chronicler of Villani who's writing in Genoa and he writes an account of the Battle of Crecy and then dies the year later. So you have this like, great, like he's definitely written it like right after the battle, but he's also writing it in Italy. So some people <laughs> kind of cast him aside because he's like, well, he's very geographically far away. He probably didn't have immediate access to, I mean, he certainly wasn't talking to any of the, you know, he wasn't talking to the King of England, which some of these other accounts would have been. But at the same time, I mean, Genoese crossbowmen were in the battle. He might have spoken to them. He is writing really close to the time and he's got a lot of information. He's clearly not just making everything up. So... There is a real push and pull, and there is a certain point where you just kind of have to make a call about what you think is the best source and then argue your case, you know, about why you think this person is reliable or this person isn't. And then, you know, someone will come along and disagree with you, and that's that's history. That's that's the way that it goes, I suppose. you gotta, you, you got to point, you know, st pick your points and, and, and stick to them. Did you, when you have been... Researching crossbows, I, I assume that there's a lot of, um, you know, you found a lot of surprises uh, along the way. Um, but is there anything in particular that sticks out? Because it does seem that for something that is so sort of so well documented on the one hand, you know, we, we seem to know uh, uh, a fair bit about them. There's also just a, a whole lot that has been completely up in the air. Is there, is there anything you've mentioned, a few of them, but either that have completely surprised you or upended your expectations or uh perhaps you're you know you just you wish you knew a, a heck of a lot more about um like that one two foot crossbow <laughs> conundrum so yeah so kind of two parts so the thing that like most surprised me doing crossbow research was came partway through my phd which is just how little there had been done because i set out with this phd project that kind of assumed that we knew about as much about crossbows as we did about bows and i did the bows part first and we know loads about bows there's lots of historians have gotten really into long bows and that's kind of symbol as being a national english weapon means there's a huge amount of nationalist investment in the long bows idea and it means that there's just loads of books on the longbow and lots of engagement i was like great so there'll probably be like some stuff about crossbows and there's just like nothing so i talked about ralph Payne Galway earlier who wrote 1903 i mean if you go on amazon generally and you try and buy a book about the crossbow that's the book you're going to buy that's the one wow. that's available it's from 1903 everybody there have been some better books written since then they're very obscure and often long out of print like joseph elm wrote this book european crossbows a survey it's probably the best general history of the crossbow it was written in the 1950s uh, in swedish and translated in english in the 90s and then it's way out of print so 
there's this real kind of gap. Now you have like, there's been some, it's improved a bit recently if you read German. Uh, in the last sort of 20 years, there's a few German scholars who've really been doing their best to, to know more about the weapon, particularly studying it archeologically, looking at surviving weapons and really deep analysis. And that's what I started out doing on my PhD because that was kind of where there was a ton of evidence you could access and where more work had been done. But it's just for being a very famous weapon and, and quite a consequential one, there's not very much research done into it. And it's a little bit better now than it was when I started. But by a little bit better, I mean, there's like three more people in the field. Like it's not, it's not like we're, we're big. So it's quite niche. And that means that there's a huge amount we still don't know because we just haven't really been digging through all this evidence. And it means that you can uncover really interesting evidence. Like I was at um, the IMC Leeds uh, Medieval History Conference last year and someone was talking about how in medieval Genoa for a while they banned gambling and tournaments and told everyone to shoot crossbows instead. And I was like, that's a really cool fact I had never heard of. And I'd been doing this for, I mean, it must have been <laughs> seven years at that point, more than that. And I was like, yeah, there's loads of like really interesting little facts and stuff buried there that just hasn't come out. Um, the other thing I, I desperately want to know more about and, and hope at some point to learn more about is gun crossbows, which are my favorite weird thing. So there's there's this, they're most almost all early, like first half of the 16th century, there was a fad of putting wheel lock guns into crossbows. And so they're, they're both guns and they're crossbows. Uh, they're very fancy, so they're definitely extremely expensive weapons. They're very highly decorated. Some of them are very impressive pieces of engineering. Like some of them, they have a, the crossbow is spanned by a lever that's built into the stock. So it's kind of like, if you think of like a cowboy repeater rifle, like one of those from the Westerns, mm -hmm. like it's like that, but it's a crossbow, but also it has a gun. <laughs> and Can you fire great. them both at the same time or do you fire one so and then the we other? I think so, but like, we don't really know what they're for. So <laughs> that's the other side. And there, it does kind of fit broadly into this, this kind of 16th century fad after wheel locks get invented and you can make small guns because you couldn't really shrink down match locks that is, they don't require open flame. That's a really important part of it. No, right, no open flame in a wheel lock. So you, you find like guns and shields, guns and swords, guns and like sword canes. Uh, there's famously guns and books. And so gun crossbows kind of fit into that. But one of the things that's interesting is that they seem to be much older or at least a bit older. So there's several gun crossbows in the Doge's Palace in Venice that I would love to see. And it's very hard to get the Doge's Palace in Venice to respond to your emails because they're one of the most popular tourist sites in the world. And they seem to be, if not the oldest surviving wheel lock guns, then among them are these gun crossbows. So like almost from the start, they're putting guns and crossbows. And there's a theory that for those ones, at least they might've been for bodyguards because wheel locks do misfire and crossbows generally do not misfire, but wheel locks are much, much more powerful than crossbows. Early guns, once they get to like that level, much more lethal than bows and crossbows. So you kind of have that redundancy that you might want in an assassination situation rather than the kind of other theory for, especially for the later ones is that they're for hunting. So you have a bit of redundancy there, which I don't think makes as much sense. I think you just have a guy carrying a backup crossbow if you're out hunting and you're that rich, but right. I mean, maybe they do. I also think there's just a novelty to it. Like, yeah, I would, I mean, I would buy a gun crossbow and if you made me like, you know, the Doge of Venice, I would absolutely buy a gun crossbow. <laughs> That that actually gets to a, another point. So you mentioned this guy who was using actual artifacts back in the day uh, to shoot. But um, I really hope that you have actually shot a crossbow at some point in your life. Yeah, I mean, I've shot, mo shot modern target crossbows. Uh, I would love to shoot some historic crossbows. Uh, I have to go over to the UK to do that at some point. They are quite illegal in Ireland, it turns out. The <laughs> Irish Firearms Act defines a, a firearm as any, as any projectile weapon with a trigger. So a crossbow huh. is a gun here. So you can get like a gun license for your crossbows. But the, the, I looked into it. The paperwork is not set up for that. Cause there's all this like stuff about like, well, you know, you have to secure your, you know, these bits of your gun in separate safes and stuff. And I'm like, but my crossbow doesn't have those bits. It's a crossbow. It doesn't have a firing pin. It's a crossbow. I can't take the magazine out. It's a crossbow, you know, like this kind of stuff. So I don't, maybe I'll go down that route and explore it at some point, but I'm originally from Virginia in the States where things are much more lax. And my brother was hunted with a crossbow for a long time. So whenever I visit, we get the crossbow out and do some, do some shooting. That, and, and that's something that I, I also wanted to, um, to ask you is just how you got into 
this specific area, which again, I think is funny because everyone in a sort of fantasy or medieval movie setting has probably seen crossbows tons of times. It feels like there should be a lot of crossbow scholars out there because, you know, they're very prominent, but um, it seems like it's not necessarily a, 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 a as popular a, a realm. Uh, so how did you get into it? So I got into it during my PhD. So okay. under my, my undergrad research, I had been researching medieval armor, which I thought was interesting. And then around the end of my undergrad thesis, I came across this book called Alan William, well, by Alan Williams called The Night and the Blast Furnace, which is an amazing book. It's also like 250 euros. So don't go out running and buying it, but it's amazing. And also it was like everything I ever wanted to do in a book already. So I was like, okay, well, that one's out the window. And Alan Williams is <laughs> a very senior academic. He's actually, his PhD was in chemistry and in background in metallurgy. And he, so he did all these really impressive metallurgical analysis of armor. And he just, this is what he did, like, aside from being a chemist, a chemistry professor then he worked at the wallace collection it's a really interesting career you know this guy spent probably 20 plus years writing this book and it's an absolute masterpiece and i was like okay well so that's off the shelf let's do something else let's look at the attack on armor so i was gonna look i was gonna look at development of guns bows and crossbows and kind of the from the, in the 14th and 15th centuries so my original idea which i still think I, I thought of different ways i would do it now and i still think it would be an interesting project was to kind of was to look at the use of bows and crossbows and see how the introduction of early gunpowder affected them and when it starts having an obvious effect, which I think now having done more research is really, you'd have to push it into the 16th century to really get a, a clear picture of that. But like, cause early gunpowder is cannons. And then you, so at what point do we start getting thing arquebuses and stuff? So when, when do these technologies kind of overlap and how do they affect each other? So I, I did like kind of a bit early study of all three of them in the first year. And then when we were talking about supervisor, we're like, okay, we have to drop the guns. It's too much. There's too much stuff here. We got to just pick two. And I picked bows and crossbows because they are, are quite overlapping technology. The, the mechanics of them are, are similar. They're both, I mean, crossbows are just really powerful, small bows you stick on a stock, fundamentally. So that had that shared relationship. So I started on that and I did a bit of bow research and that was fine. I had like a nice little piece on bows. Uh, there's not a ton of surviving medieval bows, uh, but we do have things like the Mary Rose, which is 1545. So it's not medieval but it had hundreds of bows on it. It's the only surviving English longbows, but it's a huge database with tons of research that's been done into it. And then most of the other bows, the few that there are, they dig them up in bogs. There's a couple from Ireland, there's a couple from Denmark. So you have, there's an interesting kind of archaeological record, even if it's very spotty. And then I got it to crossbows and I was like, oh my God, there's nothing here. <laughs> like no one has done hardly anything. And it's very patchy. And the stuff like Joseph Alm's book, which I mentioned before, is very, very good. Joseph Allen was Swedish and was a bit limited to what he could access. So his book, while it's very good, is leans towards Swedish and German evidence. So if you're interested in French crossbows, there's not a lot there. He does have a bit on Spanish crossbows, although that was later historians like Dirk Britting, who was a curator at the Met, did a lot more work on Spanish crossbows specifically. So you, because there's a whole pile of very distinct Spanish crossbows, mostly from late 15th, early 16th century. There's tons of crossbows in the Roy in the, the Hospitaller's army in Malta, which were possibly used at the Great Siege. So there's all these kind of crossbows scattered across Europe and then the world, because there's actually quite a lot of crossbows in places like the Met, Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, Chicago Art Museum, a bunch of places in America have them, which were great. Actually, American museums are much better about letting you use their images of their collections for free. So like most of the pictures in my book from American museums. And then... There's also a whole private market for medieval weapons. So there's loads of stuff on the private market we won't ever see. So there's just this mountains of evidence and it just really overwhelmed me. And at that point, like, cause when you're early in a PhD, you're, you're really looking for like, okay, where do I make my unique contribution? And when I found that I was like, this is both extremely frustrating because it means that this is all I'm going to do now. But also I found my niche. No one else is here. You know, I don't have to worry about like, you know, I go to my PhD defense and somebody's like, all of your evidence is wrong. Because nobody else is in my field. They're all dead. So <laughs> I had that kind of slightly liberating moment of like, you know, you're alone in your field. So it's, it's a little bit isolating and you, know, you don't really, you can't easily have that exchange of ideas that you would really like. But at the same time, it's much harder for people to contradict me. So that's nice. One thing I wanted to ask you about um, is this is something that we get a ton on uh, Ask Historians. Uh, we will get people asking about uh, I'm a undergrad, love history, thinking about getting a PhD. What are the career options? What should I be doing? What 
um, uh, all that. You got your PhD in, in 2016, and um, you have since, as I understand it, um, left academia. And I want to know, I guess, left potentially formal academia. Um, uh, I wanted to know what your, you know, what your process was like there um, and, and how you've sort of continued to be academically active, you know, um, in, you know, um, outside of some of those sort of formal structures. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I was, I didn't stay in academia very long after my PhD, basically. I finished my, my now wife, uh, then girl, uh, then fiance, I think, were both in academia. She was kind of earlier in her PhD. She had done a, a master's with funding. I had gone straight into a PhD. So we were slightly, and I'd been a year ahead of her. So we were slightly out of sync. So she was part with her PhD. I had just finished mine and we needed to pay rent. So there wasn't really like a, a there's a lot of, when you're trying to go in academia, like waiting for funding and trying and living on accumulated savings and not a lot of immediate income. So I kind of needed a job and went straight for a job thinking that maybe I'd kind of pivot back to academia. And then real motivators for me to just not try in academia was meeting people who I really admired and who are very talented historians and have much better publishing records than I have in much more in demand areas and watching them not get jobs routinely, like just no career opportunities. So there was, there was a, I don't know his name, it was Dr. Thomas Smith. He's a great historian. You should read his work. And if you ever, if you're ever in an area and you see him able to give a talk, that man will make like papal letters interesting. That's my pitch for Tom Smith. Like <laughs> I find his subject to be excruciatingly dull, but I absolutely adore hearing him talk about it. And he now teaches at the rugby school in the UK and he's got a public, he's published like 12 books. Like this guy turns out articles, really dynamic teacher, really great scholar. And I was like, man, Tom's not going to make it. I'm definitely not going to make it. I should go get a different job. So I kind of, it's a real demotivator when that first happens to you. You know, I, I didn't really do a lot of independent research and I was pretty burned out by my PhD as well. Like it's, it's an exhausting process getting one of those over the line. So I wasn't doing a lot of research. I did manage to go and present at the International Nuva Conference in Leeds, I think in 2018, which was a really good experience, which I, I paid. They have a bursary if you kind of aren't making very much money, but aren't a student. So that was kind of, that helped me afford to go because conference fees are really expensive. And if you don't have funding to pay for them, it's a huge problem. And yeah, so I didn't really do a lot of research. And the kind of way I stayed plugged in really was doing Ask Historians, was answering questions, even if I didn't answer quite as many and still don't answer quite as many as I used to. Uh, it was still great to like have the community and, and be there reading about history and answering every so often and chiming in, and just seeing other people being engaged in history around you. is a It's the thing that I miss most about not being in academia because I don't like it's not like I miss the job really because the job for as great as the idea of doing historical research for a career is there's a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork and misery <laughs> to being in academia and I don't miss that but like the ability to just like sit down and talk about history with people reliably is something that I, I really miss from my PhD experience and Ask Historians was kind of a great supplement to that and even like I would meet uh, other flared users if I was in their city so I met several I've met several players in person for beers, you know, if I was in Berlin or if I was, or some if they were over in Dublin for a conference, we would meet up. So that was a great way to like meet in person. So that really helped. And then in early 2020, I picked the perfect year to like finally make myself pitch a book. So I just sent off a, a book pitch to Pen and Sword Books to lock me in. Cause if I, I, I'm meaning to write this book for, it must've been four years at that point. Like I was like, I should write this book. I should write this book. I should write this book. And I was like, if I get a deadline, if someone else, if I've told someone else I have to write this book, then I have to write this book. And then, like, the world ended, but I was like, I still have to write the book. And I was a bit saved by it. We moved in with my in-laws to kind of avoid the plague for for what was supposed to be two months and ended up being two years. But that meant that we weren't really paying the crazy rents anymore. So even though I didn't have access to a library, I just bought loads of books. So now I have I have too many books. I have so many books, which is great. I love it. I have, I have so many crossbow books now. But... It was an interesting experience writing in that, but yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting trip kind of staying involved in history and then getting more involved now that I'm trying to promote the book and talking to other historians and trying to cut this. There's been more, I, I went to the online IMC this last year and kind of saw a lot of newer scholars, people who are either nearly finished the PhD or just getting their PhDs um, 
doing research on interesting aspects of weaponry and warfare and, you know, starting to kind of follow them on Twitter and be a bit more engaged with the broader community. Because I think there is, there's going to be with the state of the academic job market, a lot of people like me who have PhDs and who have an interest in history and who are not in formal academia. And I think that's a good opportunity for us to try and support each other and find out ways to get our works published, talk to each other about what publishers are good, who's worth going with and, you know, collaborate and, you know, work together to, do the best research we can in our limited time around our jobs. And that's, I guess, one of the things, not that, you know, one of the things that academics always complain about is not having enough time to do, uh, uh, to do the research they want to do anyway from, you know, with teaching and, you know, administrative stuff. But what, what are the, I guess the drawbacks, I, you mentioned conference fees, you know, not, not being able to get funded there. Do you see any, have you had any particularly strong limitations um, in terms of, you know, coming at it from an independent point of view um, that, uh, you know, uh, that having inst- institutional credentials would have really helped you with? Yeah. So, Conference fees being a big one, and then fees to visit archives or collections where they are crossbows, for my case, would be really interesting. Like, it'd be really useful if someone would pay me to fly to Northern Italy to start looking at a bunch of crossbows, because there's loads of crossbows in Northern Italy that aren't in published sources, uh, or in are in very, like, catalogs with very little detail from 50, 60 years ago. Like, the, I mentioned the Doge's Palace in Venice. They have loads of crossbows. None of that's published, or at least accessible. So there's a huge amount of information that we'd love to have on these I love someone to pay me to go do it and I don't have access to that. So it's kind of, it's both financial and you have to be able to afford. Now for my case, being in Europe, that's a little bit less of a barrier to get to Europe. Like it's obviously much harder if you are in the American Midwest and you're looking, I want to look at like English chancery records. That's a much bigger financial burden, but it's also a big time burden. You know, I get 30 days, I get whatever annual leave I get for, I mean, I'm an Irish public servant, so I get quite a lot of annual leave, which is nice. And, but like, you know, that's for spending time with my family. I have a wife and a daughter and my wife doesn't want to do all of our holidays to places that have crossbows. So, (laughs) you know, you have to balance that as well. So it's a little bit, it's, it'd be easier if that was my job and I I could go on time I was paid. So there are definitely limitations. I haven't encountered too many issues with people kind of turning me away because I don't have a university behind me, though I haven't tried, you know, everywhere. So it, it may be a barrier for others. But there's, particularly in military history, there is quite a good established record for independent historians, which has helped. So a lot of kind of people who would have worked in the field before wouldn't have been academic minded or would have come from unusual academic backgrounds like museum curation. Uh, so there's a little bit more flexibility. So a lot of places like royal various royal armories are a bit more accepting of letting someone like me in because they probably have some old military vet who's also really interested in you know, halberds or whatever, and he comes in and looks at them. So there's there's a little bit more of a non-standard career path to publishing in military history, which I think helps access some of those collections. I don't know if that's true if you're trying to get into the papal archive, for example. That might be right. a, a bigger barrier. That's certainly something that I think a lot of, as you say, a lot of people are going to have to navigate more. Um, you've talked a bit about... Um, Ask historians um, uh, already in your work on ask historians. What are the um, uh, you mentioned in the the t- discussion that we had before taping this uh, that uh, you have a very popular answer or set of answers on um, uh, long shanks? I suppose because of the uh, uh, you know movie treatment of him. Um, but uh, what are some of the other questions that you seem to always? always seem to come up, always seem to, you know, be able to answer um, around uh, the areas that you have uh, discussed. Yeah. I mean, obviously I answer crossbows, questions about crossbows. That's like my default, but I also spend a lot of time answering questions about the crusades and particularly for some reason, questions about the movie kingdom of heaven. I did the media Mondays on kingdom of heaven, which is probably now what I, I just direct people to that. Or if people have questions about it, it's like, if it's not there, ask it again, but it might be, I spent a lot of time, I rewatched the whole movie and took notes and I, I wrote up a whole thing about it. Director's but even cut? Like, yeah, director's cut, always director's cut. <laughs> but even my, my first ever answer, my eight-year my eight year old answer that's my probably my most popular, is about how Saladin is portrayed in the movie Kingdom of Heavens. So that was like what got me hooked on Ask Historians and like that kind of thrill of like, because that answer I think got over a thousand upvotes 
uh, that was quite quite a big deal for like my like my first ever post on it. So that really like if you wanted to like get someone really addicted to ask historians, that was like a great way to do it. Uh, and so I kind of feel this real attachment to that movie. I also quite like Kingdom of Heaven in a way that I do not like Braveheart. Uh, <laughs> I have a real strong. I mean, the best medieval history movie is A Knight's Tale, and I, I adore A Knight's Tale. I don't know how much I can really historically answer about a knight's tale i mean i know things about jousting and armor and and all that but like it's just it's hard to like suppress the urge to just gush about how good that movie is it's it's so good (laughs) do you do you find it hard to watch uh movies this is uh, something that i've i've talked with people before about um i i find it very hard at coming from the background of you know classical music and musicology I find it very hard to watch anything where someone is miming, playing an instrument, and they're very obviously not playing an instrument um, correctly, or you know, miming, conducting when they very obviously have no idea what they're doing. Uh, do you find it very hard to watch some of those movies when you when you go that that crossbow is completely and utterly inaccurate? Yeah, I mean, they're almost always from the wrong century. That's the classic crossbow problem you see, because like, no one wants to show people with wooden crossbows, so they almost always give them steel crossbows. And it's like the 12th century and still crossbow. We've kind of been moving the scale earlier and earlier. It's when we think it was from, but like no one puts it earlier than the 13th century. And it's not really mainstream till the 14th, but it's just, it looks cool. And for a lot of people, it's like the classic image of what a crossbow looks like. So you see them everywhere, but I'm, I'm really bad. Like I love some of the movies, the historical movies, but I'm definitely not one of those people that goes out and watches a lot of medieval epics. Cause I am kind of insufferable when I'm watching them. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I mean, my PhD, like one of my co- front cohorts for my PhD was like, you know, he'd watch the Vikings and the Last Kingdom, and like, you know, he was a specialist in early medieval Ireland, and he just loved that, even if it was awful. <laughs> I was never that person. I can watch some of them, and and I I do quite like them. Um, I kind of like them more when they're more abstracted or weird. Like I like A Knight's Tale. I also really like The Little Hours. That's a really odd movie about nuns. That's based on um, the Decameron. Which is, so that's more of a a great adaptation of medieval literature rather than medieval history. But I love that kind of, because it uses modern language. So they're all just like swearing at each other all the time. It's like Aubrey Plaza. People are just like really odd movie, but you get to see uh, Nick Offerman rant about Guelphs for like seven minutes. And that's great. Like, <laughs> so I like that, that clear sign. I appreciate in a movie is like, we have thought about this and we have decided to do something weird or to deviate like the music in a knight's tale is very clearly like we have thought about this and we are, we are sticking water music in very deliberately and we are making these Chaucer jokes. And we have clearly like, we know who Chaucer is. We know this is not what he was like, but we're making the jokes. And, like we're showing you that versus stuff like Braveheart just kind of feels like we weren't arsed. <laughs> oh God. Like, I don't have time for that. The, the, I mean the, the, you know, musicians are all, all, all hate Braveheart because the, uh, the pipes that they use are Illin pipes, which are Irish pipes from like the late 19th, you know, century is, is when you start getting that kind of sound. Um, and yet uh, in the soundtrack and yet, you know, the soundtrack everyone thinks is the Scottish Highland pipe. Um, uh, and even that is not necessarily uh, a, uh, <laughs> something that was around in his time. And, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of problems with that movie. It. That's it, a whole it, separate podcast. Yeah, Oof, we could have Braveheart. a whole shit on Braveheart mm. podcast. <laughs> that would actually be really fun. <laughs> All the that problems movie. with Braveheart. Uh, well, uh, you can read um, Stuart's various answers on various things, uh, including probably some criticism of Braveheart um, over on Ask Historians. Um, you can pick up uh, the book on the medieval crossbow, which uh, is fascinating, and uh, hopefully there will be uh, be much more scholarship uh, to come from Stuart Ellis Gorman. Uh, Stuart, thank you so much for coming on the Ask Historians podcast. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. I'm Tyler Alderson, and we will see you for the next episode. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. (laughs) 